Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Compass. Jennifer McKinnon is one of the um, Compass Student Seminar Committee's invited speakers for the semester. Dr. McKinnon is a seagoing physical oceanographer and part of the multi-scale ocean dynamics group at Scripps Institute of Oceanography, which is at UCSD. She studies small-scale dynamical processes in the ocean, primarily internal waves, turbulence, sub-mesoscale instabilities, and their often complex interplay. Part of her work involves going to sea to observe these processes using the ocean as a natural laboratory. Simultaneously, she is working with collaborators to turn this dynamical understanding into better parameterization of small scale processes to improve global climate models. So today she's just gonna talk to us a little bit about some of the work she and her group has been doing. And with that, I'll turn over to you, Jen, and we're looking forward to seeing your presentation. Okay, um, great. Uh, can everyone hear me? Okay, so I will apologize in advance. My kids are on and off uh, school Zooms and which sometimes does bad things to our bandwidth. So I I think they're both on breaks right now. So hopefully it will not be too bad, but just someone start yelling or put your hand up or something. If I start fading out, I could turn off my video. Uh, which might help the bandwidth. Um, okay, let me try to share. Okay, could someone let me know if they could see this screen? Yes, I can yes. see it. Okay, um, great. Uh, and let me know if there's any problems with it. So. Thank you so much for the invitation. I appreciate the opportunity to chat with people. Um, so the work I was gonna talk about today was to give a flavor for some of the recent activities that we've been doing in our group. So as uh, the introduction said, I'm part of a group of a multi pi group at Scripps, whose names are listed here, called the Multi-Scale Ocean Dynamics Group. And we build and deploy a variety of kind of novel instrumentation, which helps us see especially kind of small scale processes in the ocean in, um, high resolution and lets us kind of learn more about their physics. So very quick, broad introduction. Oh, wait, hold on. I just lost my power. Let me just grab that one sec. Uh, sorry. Okay. I'm back. Um, sorry. So people historical, a lot of, uh, Physical oceanography started off by these large sections, was tile sections that people did crossing the ocean. And these are sections across the Atlantic. And if you take sparse resolution measurements of things like temperature and salinity, the ocean looks like it has very broad scales, large spatial scales, slow time scales. You can see the large scale sinking of things like Atlantic bottom water, North Atlantic deep water coming in at the salinity maximum, large scale processes. But the closer and closer we look, the more rich variability we see at smaller and smaller scales. And here's a nice illustration of this. Uh, if you run a one degree global resolution model of the Antarctic circumpolar current, which you can see here, it looks like a, the sort of current we teach in classes. It's large scale, it goes round and round and round. It's driven by the wind stress, geostrophic pressure gradient. Um, but when you increase the resolution of the model, suddenly you can barely even see the ACC anymore because it's so full of eddies. So the smaller scale you look both in models and in data, the higher resolution, the more nonlinear, the more complicated the processes seem to be. That happens in observations as well. Um, so here's from the, uh, if you look at global atlases of things like potential temperature, they again look very broad scale with large scale global patterns. When you start to zoom in, uh, this is from Rundrick and Ferrari using CSOR data across the Pacific, you can see smaller and smaller scales and fronts start to appear with sort of tens of kilometers of scale. Similarly with models, uh, you start to zoom in from one, one degree to one third to one tenth degree to kilometers and even meters, you can see on top of large scale things like the Gulf Stream, richer and richer sub mesoscale structures start to appear. And when you zoom in even further, you can see that not just is there horizontal small scale variability, but very high frequency and time variability, as well as the spatial variability. So 
somehow we have this multiplicity of scales. We have things that tend to have large scales and slow time scales, large spatial scales and slow time scales, like the overturning circulation, large scale distributions of water masses. And then at the other end, we have really small scale, fast time scale, high frequency types of phenomena on the ocean. And a main gist of our group's research is to understand how any of these things interact with each other, which matters to who or to whom. Does the interaction go one direction, in the other direction? Are the small scale processes important or are they just interesting? And so I thought would be a nice way to give a flavor for that today was to go through a small handful of vignettes of examples of types of research that we're working on that connect some of the small and medium scale processes to large scale processes to give you a feel for some of the interesting ways in which they could interact or not. So one of the first ways when I started out in grad school that people thought about the interactions between small scale processes and large scale circulation was looking at one going from very one end to the other. So at the smallest scales in the ocean, you have full on three dimensional turbulent mixing. A lot of this is driven by breaking internal waves and occurs at scales of 10 meters, one meter, and then the turbulent um, cascade goes all the way down to centimeters in the ocean. That process is extremely scale separated both in time and in spatial scale from the large scale global overturning circulation. And historically, they were studied by totally separate communities of people, cultures, uh, you know, scientific lineages, etc. But um, it, it's been clear for some time that the small scale turbulence has plays a large role on the large scale circulation. And one way to think about this is to look at this super duper simplified schematic of global overturning circulation. Deep water, this is some uh, schematic view of the northern part of some ocean, say the North Atlantic or, or wherever, or some zonal average of the ocean. So you have deep convection, high latitudes, mixed dense water. The way we teach it in class, they just covered this in my son's sixth grade science class. And they said, oh, deep water is formed at high latitudes. It gets to low latitudes. The sun warms it up uh, all the way down to the abyss and it rises up and then completes the circuit of things like the Gulf Stream. Sunlight, of course, does not penetrate more than, you know, uh, does not penetrate very far in uh, seawater. And so it's actually turbulent mixing that is controlling the weight that sunlight, that heat diffuses down, that this water uh, is allowed to warm up. And energetically, the potential energy supplied by turbulence mixing heat down gives potential energy to the system, which is then converted to the uh, kinetic energy of the global overturning circulation. Um, and that turbulence is largely driven by breaking internal waves. So one of the things we spent a long time working on a few years ago was how to connect uh, global magnitudes and patterns of turbulent mixing from internal waves to the large scale circulation. Um, people initially were looking for kind of one number. There's Walter Monk's uh, Abyssal Recipes paper saying that we need a certain average value of turbulent mixing to drive that overturning circulation. But the more and more we look, the more it's become clear that that type of turbulent mixing is very far from spatially uniform. And in fact, it has dramatic spatial patterns that have several orders of magnitude variability. So this is part of the thesis work of a former student of mine, Caitlin Whalen, who's now at the University of Washington. She made indirect estimates of the strength of internal wave driven turbulent mixing um, using a parameterization applied to the global Argo database. And so there's gives you a vast spatial coverage. And you, you can see uh, one that there's a order of magnitude variability in turbulence, but it has clear spatial patterns. So it's elevated in the Western Pacific compared to the East. Um, it's elevated in uh, over mid-ocean ridges, if you look real carefully, like the Southwest Indian Ridge, um, and there's a variety of other patterns that drive some of this orders of magnitude variability. So we spent some five or six years working on an NSF funded climate process team that came up, that put together our best ideas of um, what processes set the global patterns of this turbulent mixing in ways that could be represented then in regional and global scale models. And many of those parameterizations for internal tide driven mixing and some wind driven near inertial uh, internal wave mixing are now available for use in models. And I think have shown some uh, models have shown to be sensitive to, to how those parameterizations are conducted. 
that's um, the first step of this process, which was a which was a very fun collaborative effort. Um, some of the ongoing work, which is very much open, is to then really think about how these global patterns of turbulence, which vary by, as I said, orders of magnitude, convolve with things that you care about, and that could be how the specific pathways of um, temperature subduction and stirring around compare with global mixing rates, oxygen, chlorophyll. I think there's a lot of productive uh, opportunity in, in thinking about the convolution of these sorts of processes in terms of the effect of distribution of both physical, biogeochemical properties. So that's sort of, that was looking at the a very scale separated interaction between small scale turbulence and the large scale circulation. But a lot of the more recent work we've done in the last five years or so has been looking at intermediate connections between small or medium scale different parts of the processes of this chain here. So I'll give a couple examples of that from ongoing work. Um, one of them is looking at the interaction between internal waves and the turbulence they produce and not the very large scale circulation on which it has an indirect uh, effect, but on intermediate motions like mesoscale eddies in which there can be non-weak uh, dynamically significant interactions between how internal waves propagate, evolve, and break, and the mesoscale eddy fields they're propagating through. So one of the biggest candidates for looking at that interaction is wind-driven inertial waves. So if you're on a rotating planet, uh, anytime you whack on the ocean and disturb it in any way, the natural resonant frequency of, of water or anything on a, on a rotating planet is the inertial frequency. It's the local component of the rotation rate. So storms pass over the ocean, they give a, a, a push um, to surface water and it starts moving at the inertial frequency. Lateral convergences and divergences of that uh, pump the base of the mixed layer and make downward propagating internal gravity waves that have close to an inertial frequency as well. So you can see this in the surface drifter here. Sorry, I somehow lost the caption. This is from a paper by Eric DeSaro. Surface drifters often move in, uh, especially after storm passage, these inertial circles, you see this all the time. And, but the downward rate at which the resultant internal waves propagate uh, seems increasingly clear that it is sensitive to all sorts of things, particularly interaction with mesoscale and submesoscale eddies. And that is gonna determine where those internal waves dump their energy into turbulent mixing. Um, and they set some of those global patterns. So one of the ways that it became clear early on that there was an interaction between these inertial motions and mesoscale eddies was further work on surface drifters. Uh, this is work, some work from Shen Elipo and colleagues and which you, you all may already be familiar with. Um, so they took uh, global arrays of surface drifters and looked at the frequency content of how the surface drifters were moving. And this plot on the left here is a function of latitude and frequency from surface drifters and show this stripey pattern here shows that uh, there's a significant component of the surface drifter motion which follows the local inertial frequency. So this is the Coriolis frequency is a function of latitude, meaning that to order one, whatever latitude they're at, storms come by, uh, blow in the ocean, get these things moving, and they resonate at the local inertial frequency. But if you look closer, you can see that there are deviations from the inertial frequency. And this plot over here is a plot of the um, relative frequency shift um, compared to the local inertial frequency. So sometimes they don't exactly ring at the inertial frequency. And they looked even further and looked at the relative frequency shift as a function of mesoscale eddy vorticity. So if you, I said a few minutes ago that if you whack on the ocean, uh, anything on the ocean will tend to move at the local inertial frequency. But if you're in a mesoscale eddy that has its own vorticity, the effective vorticity, the eff effective inertial frequency is not just the planetary vorticity, but the combination of that and that um, vorticity for mesoscale eddies. So this paper I thought was uh, remarkable that it showed so clearly that the relative frequency shift clear uh, strongly correlates with the presence of mesoscale eddies. So that means that the inertial circles feel the vorticity of those eddies, but it also means that their convergence and their divergence rates and their subsequent evolution into internal waves and breaking also cares about their vorticity. 
And so there are important consequences to that. One of those consequences uh, has to do, as I said, with the rate at which when you make turn inertial motions at the surface and a downward propagating internal waves, that they lose their turbulent, lose their energy to turbulent mixing. So this is the same data set from my former student, Caitlin. Uh, and she took all those global uh, measurements of turbulent mixing inferred from Argo data and subsetted them in two subsets. One was uh, measurements that were made in areas of weak mesoscale kinetic energy. And the second was measurements made in areas of strong mesoscale kinetic energy. The top one is the weak mesoscale kinetic energy. And it's the average, this is averaged over several, uh, this is several years worth of data averaged all around the world between 30 and 60 degrees north of the turbulent dissipation rate as a function of depth and year. And you can see a seasonal cycle that it's strong in the winter when it's stormy. Weak in the summer, strong in the winter. Weak in the summer, strong in the winter. You can see that this is elevated turbulence that extends well below the surface. So this is not direct wind-driven mixing. This is the wind makes internal waves. They propagate down 1,000 meters, 1,500 meters, and are controlling the pattern of turbulence in for the whole uh, upper kilometer of the ocean. But when you compare that with a pattern in areas of strong mesoskeletal energy, there's a dramatic increase. Uh, it's the same pattern, but the rate is much stronger. So the suggestion is that somehow the interaction between these near inertial internal waves and mesoscale energies is significantly enhanced, enhances the rate of energy, which is drawn out of one or both of them. You can get some further insight into that from numerical models. So this is from a colleague, Roy Barkin, uh, who's now, uh, uh, I think at the University of Tel Aviv. And this is his thesis work at Scripps though. And so he, this is an idealized re-entrant Southern Ocean model. So it's a little box. You pretend it's the Southern Ocean. It's going round and round, but really it's just a box. So it comes out one end, goes in the other. You blow, he did two things. One is he blew a wind stress on it, which was like the story we tell our students that there's a steady wind stress in the Southern Ocean, which drives the ACC indirectly. And the second is that he added a time variable wind stress that would make near inertial internal waves. So there's the steady wind and then the one with the time variable component that also makes inertial winds. And looked at how the resultant turbulence in both cases. And this is a little movie. So the top one shows this is, so what we're looking at here is the turbulent dissipation rate of a normal ACC. And you can see like the movie at the very beginning that this ACC is not so much like a single, single you know, monotonous current, but it's broken up into a bunch of eddies. These eddies tend to be dissipative to be turbulent on their edges, where there's all sorts of fun sub mesoscale sorts of things happening. But the really interesting thing to me was that if you compare the one with uh, that also has a near inertial wave internal wave generation compared to the one without, the turbulence is much stronger. It has similar patterns, but it's much stronger. And in fact, the amount of extra turbulence that is created in the second case is more than the power going into the internal wave field. So the what's happening here is that the internal waves are acting as catalysts that actually extract energy from the mesoscale efficiently and bring in and transport the energy from the mesoscale towards turbulent uh, dissipation and turbulent mixing. So there's some type of fairly strong interaction between internal waves and these mesoscale or some mesoscale features in an eddying current like this, which plays an order one role in setting the patterns of turbulence. So we are in the process of trying to study this right now, or have been recently. There's a, a ONR funded project called NISKIN in the North Atlantic, looking at north, near inertial shear kinetic energy in the North Atlantic. So we, I was going to say, we have just wrapped up the field work, where we're going to have just wrapped up the field work. The last major process cruise was supposed to be this summer, but did not happen due to COVID. But we still have a couple of years of field work um, trying to suss out observationally the patterns of that interaction between near inertial internal waves and mesoscale eddies. And we chose the North Atlantic because it has a lot of strong storms and a lot of strong eddies, which made the ship work sometimes challenging, but uh, gives us a, a great data set to work with. Um, this is a, a multi-PI experiment, which had quite a range of different type of instruments all working in concert. As you can see, the different types of instruments are shown uh, schematically in this plot, because looking at the correlations to kind of really suss out the, the dynamical interaction and the resultant patterns of enhanced turbulence is a function of both wave properties and 
mesoscale edarc properties is a challenging one. So this, there are not a lot of results from this yet, but hopefully there will be over the next couple of years. Okay. Um, next vignette is that sometimes, so that was looking at, the previous one was looking at the interaction between turbulence and mesoscale eddies. The next one is looking at um, interactions between small scale, uh, high frequency processes like tides and how they can actually, they can go the other way that those can turn into mesoscale processes in ways that affect the larger scale flow. And this example comes from the West Pacific. And to start off this example, here is a movie. So this is work that takes place. I'll just walk you through too, bit, too many things on the slide, but walk you through it. This is work that takes place near the island chain of Palau, which is in the Western Pacific. And this movie that I'm about to play on the upper left is a plot of vorticity. Uh, so what you're going to see is Palau is this island chain here. There's a couple of really large scale currents that go by this island chain. There's the North Equatorial Current, which goes this way. It generally is blowing, blowing, going from east to west. And the North Equatorial Countercurrent is below Palau. Palau tends to go the other way from west to east. Both of them create wake eddies at the northern and southern tips of Palau. And you can see that here. You, so you can see this stream of vorticity being created by flow separation. This is just like flow around a cylinder sort of thing, except it's a funny shaped cylinder as these eddies stream off the northern tip of Palau. So the goal of this project was to understand uh, what creates this wake? You can see what initially looks like real small scale eddying features roll up into a much larger scale wake. We care about this partly because uh, these wake eddies enhance stirring and mixing in regions like this, and also because it's the process, as we all know from you know airfoils and, and airplanes and whatnot, the process of flow separation and the nature of the wake it creates is what produces drag on the flow. So this story is also one about momentum and what extracts energy, uh, how you, how, what type of drag extracts energy from large scale currents as they hit topography. So we want to understand the nature of wake creation and generation in something like this. So like all the examples in this talk, this is also one that intrinsically has multiple scales in it. And so if you look at the wake with different sorts of measurements, you can see it has a variety of different scales. So here, uh, Here's a bunch of different measurements of the scales from different types of instruments. So you can see some scales looking at a VSO. Use HF rate and see the scales of wake eddies, which are smaller, have sort of tens of kilometers. Um, these are, there's shipboard and glider measurements that also show tens of kilometers and smaller. And then some of the really small scale ones we looked at with detailed shipboard surveys like uh, this here, which I'll show in the next slide. This is just zoomed in at the very the northern tip of Palau, and you can see wake eddies being created that have about a one kilometer scale. And so one of the question is, if you have wake eddies that are one kilometers, 10 kilometers, 100 kilometers, what's driving who and how do they all relate? So one of the things that came out of this started from looking at the really small scale wake eddies. And so, this is some work we did zooming way in. So here's the Palau Island chain again. The land part where people live is mostly down here, but the um, really shallow water reef, the, uh, the essential profile of the island where it's only sort of 50 meters or 10 meters deep extends much further north. So we looked right here at the very Northern tip. So right at the Northern tip, one of the first things that we noticed is that not only is there a very strong mean flow going by, but there's also strong tides, which generally happens when you have, uh, you know, bare traffic tides hit shallow water. Tides get really strong in shallow water. So at the very Northern tip here, these two circles here showed tidal ellipses. And you can see that um, compared to the shape of the Northern tip of this island, the tidal excursion is quite significant. So there's both a mean flow going whoosh to the left, and there's a tidal flow that is large compared to the size of this island. And so one of the stories that we learned from here was that the interaction between the mean scale, the mean current and tidal flow, that combination plays an important role in how you generate the small scale part of an island wake. And you can see about 
So the, the blue lines here show some repeat patterns we did with the ship sampling. So we went back and forth over this multiple times over a tidal cycle. And if you look at that, this is just at one particular depth. Here's the north part of uh, Palau again. The arrows here are surface velocity and the color is the vorticity normalized by the inertial frequency. And the current is shown in the top plot. It's advancing in time, so multiple passes through it. And this is as the tide is shifting back and forth. So you can see in the first pass, the tide is going this way and it's making a lee eddy on this side. And then it starts to change uh, and you start to see strong eddies on the other side, which get stronger as you go along. Now there's a very strong lee eddy on uh, this side of the tide. And these are have Rossby numbers of sort of 20 or 30. So these are very nonlinear features. When you look at not just a couple, but many examples of this, it seems as though it's really the combination, the relative strength of the tidal flow and the mean current that is setting what type of wake eddies you get. So what you expect depends on the relative strengths of those things. And so if you have a very, for example, a strong mean flow compared to the tide, then you get eddies that are all the same sign. Let's say here's a, you have a strong flow that's just going left here, but there's a tidal flow on top of it. You get a pulsing flow that discretizes the formation of the eddies. And this is a different type of discretization than like Struhall numbers or other things that are intrinsic properties of flow separation. So the flow is mostly going west, but there's a pulse every tide, every time the tide goes this way and you get eddy, eddy, eddy. Um, or if the tidal flow is stronger compared to the mean flow, you can actually have the flow reversals like we observed during this instance where you have eddies of both signs created, but they're all advected downstream with the mean flow. And so the relative strengths of these things really seems as though it sets the pattern of vorticity formation. So further work on this is being done by my student, Kristen Zeiden, pictured here. Um, and one of the cool things that she's found is that if you look at vorticity formation from an array of moorings. So we put out all these moorings here. And if you just look at a triangle of moorings, I think it's this one, F2, F3, F4, and say over a whole year, what do we know about vorticity formation uh, when you have uh, in, in this sort of situation? And what she found is that you get the strongest vorticity production when you have tides and a strong mean flow that you need both in, it, in order to get the strongest production of vorticity. And you can see this a little bit here. So the top plot here is the mean direction of flow. She's highlighted two periods when there's westward flow, which is negative here. So the, here's one period of westward flow and another period of westward flow. And if you look at this uh, triangle of moorings, which is on the west side of the separation point, you get strong generation of vorticity when the some of the strongest generation of vorticity is when you have those periods of westward flow. But if you look at the details of the vorticity here, you can see a bunch of these high frequency fluctuations. If you look at that in spectral form, it has a very strong tidal component. So these are tidal eddies that are made by a clipping mechanism, but they are preferentially generated when there are both tides and a strong westward mean flow. Um, the uh, these aggregate downstream and some of the work she's doing for her last chapter for her thesis now is to look at how these eddies coalesce and aggregate downstream and turn into a large scale wake and comparing this to both the moorings and glider sections downstream of Palau and you can see the net aggregate is to make a large scale order one Rossby number wake uh, as these eddies sort of all pile together in vortex merging types of ways. So one of the cool things about this is that it's not just a story about eddies and eddy formation, but this is a momentum story. It's saying that the combination of really high frequency processes near flow separation points, the combination of high frequency tidal processes and low frequency currents sets the nature of wake formation. Wake formation controls drag and drag controls how momentum is lost from the large scale currents that are going by. So Palau is one fun example of that, um, that we were, where we were working, but there, an open, interesting open question is whether similar mechanisms might be happening other places. And here's some work uh, from Eric Chassinger and uh, David, uh, I think not John, David Marshall, um, looking at the Gulf Stream separation. And they're playing around with what makes the Gulf Stream separate 
uh, in models, sometimes it doesn't always separate the right way in models. And I don't know a ton about the Gulf Stream, but one of the things they're playing with was the effective viscosity in the model. And that showed that that had a, an important inference on influence on how the Gulf Stream separates. So a potential interesting research question would be places like this. I think none of these models includes tides or, or real small scale eddies like this, which could be act as a souped up viscosity. And so whether or not that matters would be a fun thing for someone to look at. Okay, vignette number three um, is switching gears. This is now we're looking, uh, this is a story about, uh, you know, again, all interactions between multiple different scales of things. This is in the Bay of Bengal. Uh, here's India. So this is this uh, Western side of India. One of the interesting, uh, so the, this is a region which is, uh, we are working here in part because it is a, a huge societal global influence. Um, one of the uh, favorite statistics here is that there are more people living inside this circle, which is a uh, watershed that, that feels impact of kind of monsoons in this region than living outside of it. So there's a huge percentage of the world's population there. And the overall goals of this project was monsoon prediction. One of the reasons monsoons are poorly understood in the Bay of Bengal is because there's all this crazy fresh water running around that has a plays a uh, important but poorly understood role in mediating air sea transfers and those in turn set the propagation and strength of monsoons. Mm -hmm. So the Bay of Bengal has all this fresh water that's pouring out of these very large rivers that drain this enormous water basin, uh, river basin. And this water comes out and it swirls around in all these sort of mesoscale eddies. And so where they're trying to understand the process by with this fresh water is spreading around, around the bay, how it's stirring and mixing into the basin and how that funny salinity driven stratification then mediates air sea interaction in this region. But the first part of that is just understanding how fresh water is stirred into the bay through mesoscale processes and subsequently mixed in. And this is yet again an example where there's multiple scales of physical processes that are interacting in ways that we are still trying to understand. Um, oh, and here's just a nice example. If you look at a slice through here, so this is a, a model on the top, but this is real shipboard data um, that we took. This is a 665 kilometer section of us profiling very rapidly as we drove a ship. And you can see all the really rich structure and temperature and salinity. And in particular, one of the things that matters for monsoons is that where you have strong salinity stratification, where there's real fresh water on top, you can get heat trapped subsurface. So this water is warmer but saltier than the surface water. And so as monsoons or cyclones come by, there can be these funny things. You usually think of wind-driven mixing and hurricanes or cyclones as cooling SST, but in this case, it can actually warm SST because it mixes up this heat trap below and provides an explosive uh, amount of fuel for some of these storm systems. That's why we're trying to understand this process. And so two of the things that I'll just mention that we're working on now. Um, so the first part of that is how you get fresh water drawn out from the edges of basin into the interior. And so this is some work being done by my postdoc, uh, Yakara Mazzoli. And she is looking at uh, starting with one instance we have here. This is an event we observed last summer, 2019. Here is an SST map. So this is the west coast of India here. And you can see that there's um, some type of event, there's a pair of mesoscale eddies that are drawing this uh, fresh water off the coast into the interior. And you can see it in SST. She's been calculating finite time Lyapunov exponents for those who, who are interested in these sorts of things. And you can see it if you zoom in on this area, you can see here, this is now sea surface height. So there's this pair, there's this eddy dipole, which often sits in the western part of the bay. The Bay of Bengal is kind of small and these eddies get stuck. They propagate to the west as, as they do and they get stuck and they sit there and just um, between eddy dipole pairs draw off these tendrils of fresh water. So you can see the currents between uh, sea surface height images drawing fresh water offshore. We did a bunch of shipboard sampling on this side of the eddy. And here's one example of that shipboard section. Um, this is the edge of the eddy here and along jet velocity, we're coming around the side. So this is, I think this section, oh, it's this section here. You can see the near surface water is cool and salty. So this is water that's uh, actually upwelled water coming from the coast. It's cool, this isn't river water, it's upwelled water. It's cool and salty. It has an extremely strong uh, biological signal of chlorophyll and backscatter because it's coastal water coming into the interior. So 
one of the things that she is working on is looking at trying to understand how often this sort of process of filaments being drawn offshore by mesoscale eddies is by looking at several decades worth of satellite data to try to get a frequency distribution and some understanding of the, the variability of that process of drawing water offshore. Um, once it gets offshore, it becomes not a mesoscale, but a sub-mesoscale process. And so one of the students in our group, Taylor McKee, who's working with my colleague, Drew Lucas, is looking at some of these processes. So right at the edges of these eddies, here's another view a little bit later on. This is again, along jet velocity, temperature and salinity. So there's a range of crazy processes happening here. So in this example, wind is blowing into the page. So for people who think about wind driven stuff like many things, on the left side of this filament, the wind is going into the page, the Ekman transport is pushing fresh water over heavy, so it's putting light water. Um, yeah, it's fresh water over heavy, so this uh, water, this thin fresh water is moving over top of the heavy water and this real thinner and thinner streamer. But on the right side, it's pushing heavy water over light so that it gets very deep. And right on the edge where there's a uh, this type of Ekman buoyancy flux where you're pushing heavy water over light water, the water column mixes and there are these real funny little instabilities here which are probably something like symmetric instability. Um, real small scale nonlinear things that are actually controlling the rate at which this coastal water is being mixed into the open basin. So multi-step mesoscale eddies to sub-mesoscale, very small scale instabilities are controlling that rate of mixing. Okay, and then very Final example um, is thinking, again, thinking about small scale processes as being relating back out to large scale patterns that we care about. And so for this final example, we're gonna turn to the Arctic. So the Arctic is a very funny place. It has this crazy stratification. So here's a typical profile. This is from Jen, one of the paper by Jen Jackson, and it has She's done this clever thing where because the ar Arctic stratification is compressed, she's put the y-axis on a log scale. But there's a couple of different water masses going down. The upper, the Arctic Ocean is generally stratified by salinity. So you can see it goes from fresher to denser or fresher to saltier. Within that, there are pockets of subsurface heat that are allowed to be warm subsurface because the stratification is controlled by salinity. So the one that we're interested in is this one labeled Pacific summer water, which tends to be 30, 50 or something meters below the surface. Um, Mary Louise Timmerins wrote this lovely paper in 2018 in which she looked at the evolution of the subsurface water mass. And you can see it's like this lurking red blob of doom, which is growing over the last few decades until it's filling out this whole part of the Canada basin. This is subsurface heat. It's 30 as a 30 to 50 meters below the surface. When this, this goes well under the main ice pack. So as this heat gradually diffuses upwards, we think this is one of the things that is accelerating sea ice melt in this region in a way which is not currently represented in most models. Um, here's an example of trying to think about these things in a model. This is winter sea ice concentration from a model um, from Arthun. I don't know how to, I'm sure I mispronounced this at all. And you can see we're working on this side of the Arctic over here that the enhanced sea ice melt is coming out of Bering Strait, which is where this Pacific water comes out of Bering Strait and is spreading into the Arctic. The model looks just like these plots that Mary Louise made of warm subsurface water coming in, diving subsurface and spreading out. So the question that motivated the work I'm about to show is to understand how this heat coming in through Bering Strait, how does it dive subsurface to be this specific summer water subsurface water mass? Because it's the subduction of it, the diving subsurface that lets it spread out and melt the ice from below. And so it's small scale physical processes that control that subduction rate, which is the gatekeeper for how much of this heat can get subsurface into the Arctic and accelerate sea ice melt from below. So this work is, uh, work as part of the ONR Stratified Ocean Dynamics of the Arctic project. And here we are, this is uh, Bering Strait. We are working right here on the north coast of Alaska. And you can get a whole picture of what happened during this experiment by this amazing satellite image that uh, colleague, uh, colleagues from Sea Stars put together. Most of this work was done by John Hargrove. And 
so he's put together a composite of sea surface temperature and uh, visual images of where you can see sea ice and clouds land. And the temperature scale is down here. There's this river of extremely hot water pouring out, com comes in through Bering Strait, and then it comes through Barrow Canyon, which is the gateway from it to enter the Arctic. So there's this river of water that's just five, six, seven degrees, extremely warm. It pours out of Barrow Canyon, it shoots offshore, and it starts to do this meandering mesoscale thing. And then when it gets out here, it, you can see less of it at the surface. And the question is, where does it go as it's uh, plowing into the sea ice? So at the same time of the satellite image, we, had, we were conducting subsurface measurements here. So this is a little section of John's satellite image. And you can see subsurface profiles. So you can see that the water, this warm, very red water that was at the surface, is now becoming subsurface down here. And you can see it's diving. It's initially sort of 100 meters tall and it's thinning and squishing itself subsurface. Um, and by the time you look over here, which is under the sea ice, it's well subsurface and turned into these funny little blobby blobs, which are discrete, look like they're starting to turn into interthermocline eddies, which is, gives us some clues about what physical processes are happening here that uh, subduct this water subsurface. Oh. Sorry, and here's just fun, for fun. So this was the high resolution measurements we've made in a couple of different experiments. Uh, this one and the stuff in the Indian Ocean is with one of our group's instruments, the fast CTD, which is so-called because it is very fast. And so here's just a fun picture of that here. It's got a boom that goes 30 feet off the side of the ship and it goes up and down. It's like a torpedo. It goes up and down at five meters a second each way. So you can make, if you steam the ship at four or five knots, you can make super high resolution um, measurements, which let you see all sorts of interesting detail of stuff. Uh, so here, this is actually, this is going to be this section to look, we're going to look at one slice of this section to see what sorts of processes are happening subsurface. Oh, there we go. Um, so here is one of those sections. So on the left, this is where the this jet is coming in. And you can see in a slice of it that there is uh, warm water, which initially is 100 meters deep, squishing subsurface. So here the temperature is in color. Isopycnals are the contours. And I've highlighted just two isopycnals, which are we're using as a boundary for this water mass definition of, of this particular water class, Pacific summer water. So this water is coming in, squishing subsurface. And you can see it's starting to um, develop these structures and turn into a series of uh, discrete eddies as it's moving subsurface. Uh, salinity is what's controlling stratification here. So the temperature is not quite passive, but almost. So we have been working hard, uh, a bunch of us, on trying to understand the physical processes that control this. And our current version of the story is that as this jet meanders, you can see this is the long jet velocity of its meandering. With each meander, particularly when it does a meander to the south, there's a convergence in the cross jet velocity, which is shown here. So the water on the left is going north, the water on the right is going south. And that convergence happens just as mesoscale currents meander. When you have a convergent velocity applied to sloping isopycnals, that's setting the stage for frontogenesis, which happens in either the ocean or atmosphere. Basically, you have sloping isopycnals if they're squished together by a convergent flow. It makes them too steep, so then they're no longer in thermal wind balance or geostrophic balance. They're too steep in order to try to right themselves to the state of, of geostrophic balance that uh, ocean currents like to be in. It develops a secondary circulation, which is of the sense of righting the isopycnals. So here, because there's this wedge of uh, sloping isopycnals, when both of them get too steep, they make a secondary circulation that looks like this. You can calculate that using something called the omega equation. And it looks like this. So here's uh, the temperature plot again. And this is a plot of cross the calculated cross jet velocity in meters per day. So you just look at it here. These contours show that the, the sense of circulation we expect is a one lower cell that goes like this, and an upper cell that goes like this. So the combination of these things, of the secondary circulations created by the squashing, are driving this water uh, subsurface and squishing it into this wedge. 
as it squishes in order to conserve its total vorticity. And you squish something, it has to spin. And so as it's starting, as you squish it, it starts to spin and it's developing these intrathermocline eddy structures uh, in response to that uh, desire to conserve its vorticity. Squish, spin, and then it makes these subsurface eddies that then swirl away uh, well below, well uh, into the, underneath the main uh, ice pack. Okay, so that was the end of all of my examples. And I thought I would just end with this thing with many arrows that we don't understand um, and just comment that there are lots and lots of really interesting intersections and, and fascinating questions at all of these edges of how small, medium and large scale processes interact with each other in all sorts of ways. And so I'm hopeful that um, a lot of the, the generation of those of you who are students will help us all out by answering some of these, these really exciting questions. And I think that's all I had to say. I'm happy to answer um, answer any questions or chat or. So yeah, if anybody has any questions, you can type them into the chat or um, speak up. Hi, right, Jim. Nice presentation. I was wondering, uh, you know, when we were out there with uh, soda, we didn't really, in spite of our efforts, observe any internal waves. And so I was wondering if, uh, how, given your presentation, the mixing processes in the Arctic uh, may differ from some of the other regions in the world where they are more common. Um, that's a great question. So there, there are a couple things come to mind for that. One is that one of the, the first time we, we went to the Arctic, not this stuff, but the previous time we went, we went in 2015 to the Arctic and we got uh, on a cruise that was designed to look for near inertial internal waves. And so one of the hypotheses people have had for a while is that the, the mixing rates in the Arctic are historically super low, mostly because the tides are weak and it's covered with ice. So there's not a lot of wind generated internal waves. And so it's a really, really quiet environment for mixing. But as the ice melts, people were hypothesizing that the internal wave climate might get more and more energetic. And so the internal waves would become more and more of a player. And I, I think that's happening, but it's not happening nearly as much as people predicted. And there's interesting reasons why maybe having to do with the mixed layer being really thin because it's salinity stratified. And so that doesn't make for a very efficient generation of internal waves, or it makes really small scale high mode ones, which dissipate quickly. But having said that, I think there are some interesting intersections there that we haven't, um, that we haven't understood yet. I'll just, this one picture again, you can't, oh, you can't actually see it here. Um, but I'll just say at the, if you look at shear, which I don't have right here, but if you look at the vertical shear, um, right at the edges of this jet, there's a bunch of what looks like it might be trapped inertial wave shear at the edges, which I have not thought about, but some other people in our group might like to. So I think I think there are interesting things there that I, I don't know the answers to. Yeah, it's totally an upside down. I see Lisa's question, uh, gravity current, it's, it's Um. Yeah, I have a question. Um, you mentioned the uh, parameterization of the uh, high frequency uh, waves in respect to a low frequency problem. Uh, what is that parameterization based on? Well, there's different ways to go about it. So for the, um, the easiest thing to do the, the, the part we've done already, which because it was easier, is looking at internal waves generated by tides and the impact that that mixing has on, uh, on global circulation. And so global climate models don't resolve high frequency things. And most of them don't have tides because the, um, the, 
I forget what they're called, the, the, uh, the terms that involve the ocean's response to itself tidally are very computationally expensive. Um, self, self floating terms. Um, so, but we know a lot about where internal tides are generated because the barotropic tide, the astronomical tides are quite predictable and topography doesn't move very quickly. And so we know where you're going to get those waves generated and we know a bunch about the physics of how far they get before they break. And so we've put those things together into parameterizations based upon those, that geography and that physics. And put them into global models and show that the models are fairly sensitive to those patterns. Um, so that's that's an easy way to do it. You can do a same thing upside down version that if you have the wind making internal waves that propagate down and enhance mixing, uh, large scale models don't get that internal wave propagation and dissipation part right, but they have the winds, especially if you, you have to have a coupled model that you couple frequently enough to get to get that inertial response. But if you do that, you can get some estimate of that and then plug that into a parameterization of how we think internal waves behave and get global patterns of upper ocean mixing that follow wind stress around. Um, for the, the, the first scenario, th does it depend on bottom slope? Does it depend on the angle of the flow over the bottom slope? Uh, yep. I'm just curious what other physical- Yeah, um, yeah, the, all, of, all of those things. It's, it's a- uh, yeah, so it's it's uh, maps of tidal currents um, convolved with the bottom topography and gives you the um, the rate at which you you make internal waves and then from other experimental and theoretical work we know something about how they behave as a function of the stratification they're propagating up into and so we we. We plugged in. I, I'd be happy if you want to shoot me an email. I'm happy to point you to some papers. We have a review paper in, from 2017 in in BAMS that goes through so, some of this stuff and then links to all of the the papers, looking at it in much more detail. Th thank you for a really uh, enjoyable uh, seminar uh, today and yeah. some great yeah. answers. I okay, have uh, one question. That's, of course, excellent work. Small scale, large scale structures together. Uh, when I look at uh, this uh, regional and global circulation models, high resolution, I see uh, lots of this vorticity, sub mesoscale, mesoscale. Is that uh, real? Maybe it's overblown by the models because they are not yet including this uh, small scale parameterizations, real, which you're studying now, the small scale processes. Is this observed really on measurements via DCPs? So yeah. strong variability and vorticity of the... Yeah, I, I think that's an excellent question. I um, So I am primarily an, an observational person. And, and uh, so sometimes when I see models which very easily turn into sub-mesoscale soup, I mm -hmm. wonder about them, but but... I think there's two answers to that. One of them is that I think it's an excellent point that not all of those models know how to diffuse those motions correctly. And so one of the limitations of modeling is that it, it we're actually at the point of bandwidth limitation, even though models are amazing these days and Moore's law is doing its thing and whatever. You these these problems involve so many different scales that you can't actually get the outer forcing scales and the small scales right at the same time because some of these small scales are, are meters tens of meters and so anyway that there are situations in which that's challenging um but the second answer is the flip one is that we so our 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 stick in our group is to try to make measurements at higher and higher resolution and look at the ocean in different ways and the more we, so we've been towing thermistor chains, we're actually right now we're building uh, a new towed phased array Doppler sonar, which will get sort of swaths of really high resolution 3D velocity. And the hope with that, it, or our experience the last 10 years has been the more we look at small scales, the more variability we see. So I think a good chunk of it is real. We just haven't seen it yet because you haven't, we haven't looked in the right way. So I, lots of, lots yeah, of that's fun. Yeah, that emphasizes the importance of your work on these multi-scale interactions. Thank you. Hey Jen, I have a I have a question if I if there's still time. Oh sure. Um 
How important do you think, you know, as we, again, you're not a modeler, but um, you're someone who has a good handle of what the real ocean looks like compared to the models. Um, how important do you think it is as we, um, as we resolve smaller and smaller scales with the models to um, include air sea interaction? Um, hugely important. So one of the things, um, so that I spent the last couple of days at a, a meeting for this Bay of Bengal project. And one of the things that I think is really fascinating that we don't understand is on what scales the atmosphere and ocean interact. And, and partly because we haven't made those measurements coincidentally, and there's lots of different ways that that might be really interesting. So some places like it in that region, there are these cold pools in the atmosphere, which are extremely small in scale, but can have a big impact on the ocean. And they change the ocean stratification, which changes ocean mixing, which changes SST, which feeds back in the atmosphere. And so there, I think there are a lot of ways in which they're coupled on smaller scales than we realize. And unless you make those measurements simultaneously on both sides of the interface, you don't, we just don't know. Um, and that, you know, there are things having to do not only with SST and mixing exchanges a bit on the atmospheric and ocean, oceanic side of the turbulent boundary layers on each side, but momentum as well. Because when you have ocean currents uh, that, you know, that, that, I mean, isn't this how TVs work? I don't know anything about TVs, but the, you, you know, if ocean currents make Ekman transport and that affects fronts and that affects SST, which feeds back on the atmospheric boundary layer and its stability, which feedbacks on the wind, which feeds back on the Ekman. Anyway, so there, I think there's tons there and we don't really know. So that's not really an answer. But maybe the next push after tide, getting tides in models. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think there's probably a ton of really rich stuff there. Thank you. Do you have any students that have any questions? I have this funny feeling like when I entered grad school like two decades ago or so, you know, I was I was enmeshed in this ocean mixing community and we were told like, well, we've solved most of the problems and we sort of know, you know, 80% of how the ocean works and here's some details that you can work on for your PhD. And I feel like for the students that we teach now, it's it's kind of different. Like with all of these interactions and all these scales, they're I feel like there are a lot more open questions now that are really fascinating than there were when I was a student, which is not, which is funny, but maybe great for you guys. Silence. Yeah. Well, if nobody has um, any other questions, Roland, do we want to wrap up? Okay. You mean I should do it? Uh, I can do it. Do you, if you want to, you usually do it. So I'm not sure how you want to. Oh, I thought, I thought you do it. I, I have nothing okay, to do I, I can do it. Um, yeah, that's no problem at all. So um, thank you everyone for coming to this um, Compass seminar. Um, thank you so much to Professor McKinnon for, for giving us this presentation today and answering our questions. Um, yeah, um, tune in to the next uh, invited Compass talk. Um, I'm not sure when the next one is exactly, but um, I'm sure Roland will send out an email notifying you all of that. Um, and with that, um, thank you again to everyone, um, especially Professor McKinnon, and uh, have a nice afternoon, everyone. Okay. Nice to see you all. Have a good afternoon. Take care. Good job.